transgender like perception in Japan. So I guess I think we should just talk about that because I think that's probably the most interesting. I mean, it's the most unique perspective probably you have on YouTube. Uh, not to just like bore you down to trans women in Japan, but I mean like I don't think there's another YouTuber who is English, transgender, speaks Japanese, lives in Japan. So I think it's like a, a good place you know to talk about this as well. Got my niece. Um, so I guess how would you con contrast? the experiences of people you hear in these other countries to your own in Japan and also I guess the main thing that people probably be interested in how, how do Japanese people actually view like gender in terms of because we all know like especially the main thing to talk about when we're talking about any type of things to do with gender is masculinity in terms of masculinity is always seen as the best thing it doesn't matter like who you are it's like masculinity is the best but then every country has different masculinities. So with Western versions, it's like, you know, I look like the stereotypical masculine man because I have a beard or whatever, right? But in, in Asian countries, that's not what the masculine man looks like. It's it's all different for them. When I lived in Japan before, it was before my transition. So a huge part of actually why I transitioned is because moving to Japan initially in this kind of new entry job, I was thrust into the patriarchy in this position of almost like I was expected to be that archetypal white gaijin and male expressing at the time and I wasn't even out as like a feminine I had to act very masculine in my job the really kind of the impression I get from Japan in that sense is that if you want to you can just try and assimilate much more and Japan will facilitate that and if you if you look the part if you play the part there's, there's less of a kind of insidious transphobia that we're seeing happening in the West, that trans panic. I would never say I felt unsafe using the toilets or I would never, it, it would be unfathomable for someone, even if they were a turf and a, a conservative, to come up to me and say, you're a man. Just socially, no one would do that. No one would break that piece and just approach me randomly. And if they did, they'd have the, you know, the language barrier if and if they wanted to you know like so yeah. i've been misgendered like twice ish since being here and even that was more of a kind of androgynous like is that a man or is that a woman when i'm yeah i watched your i watched your video on that oh yeah thank you so much gosh um exactly and that was more like what clothes i was wearing and, and how much i was just acting feminine if that makes sense is there a gender even gender binary in japan or is it is it like way more flexible the, the binary genders in japan are very present i would say more than the west all right yeah you dress as you are you are a man or a woman and even within that like if you are a train driver you dress like a train driver if you work in a company you dress like a company worker and as a culture i think that at the surface level again like like the capitalism thing it's very safe and it's very uh, accepting However, as soon as you scratch that surface, as you can imagine, the the current laws happening in, and the current political climate is not as welcoming. It doesn't accept gay marriage here, so there's that that LGBTQI plus issue just is innately overhanging us. Yeah. And I think that, um, like we've seen come out in the media recently, you know, any transgender person that would get surgery would also have to be sterilised, and that's only just kind of coming out now is that maybe that's not okay. Um, laws and stuff like that are, are still an issue so there's still so much work to be done but i think that the core of that really is that japan like you said about being mostly buddhist and shintoist as a nation it doesn't have that very dogmatic christian background of like that's sinful or you must be male or female otherwise you'll go to hell you know it's it's more a case of like well most people are normally male or female you don't want to bother everyone by confusing them why don't you just choose one and, and even many Japanese trans people or LGBTQI plus people would be like, you know what's easier to do that than cause fuss? Like there's there's been a kind of law about we should understand LGBTQI plus people more and that's been in the news. Even the kind of talks about should trans people use, should trans women use female public houses, uh, like bath houses, you'll see even the, the woman, the spokesperson saying, I've given up on my, you know, chance to use public baths. I know who I am and, and I wouldn't put people through that. But I still would like some respect, you know? It's not strictly related to what you're saying, but I, I, I'm on the Vietnam subreddit a lot. Um, and one thing they said about Viet Vietnamese culture in approach to LGBT stuff is a lot of the mindset of, I wouldn't obviously say they're exactly the same, but in terms of it's like, it's not my problem. You're not 
anything to do with me. I will not say anything. But if you're my son or daughter and you're gay or trans, then that is a problem because I don't actually accept it. But if I see a trans person on the street or a gay person, I'm not going to say anything because I'm not going to make us. I think what they're getting at is in a lot of in Vietnamese society, it's more like I'm not going to get involved or I'm not going to draw attention to myself by acting out in front of everyone. Therefore, me going up to a trans woman and saying you're a bloke or something in Vietnamese and harassing them, it's just seen as like like impolite maybe i'm not sure if it's if, if it's exactly the same but in terms of i found that interesting of like they, they were talking about in relation to other things like if someone has a car accident and you can see they visibly hurt themselves you won't go over and help them because you feel like it's none of your business like stuff like that in viet in vietnam so i don't know if it's similar in japan because they have some of the similar reality you know with legacy of buddhism and maybe relative collectivism but i, I thought maybe i don't know if that has anything to do with how Japanese society view these things is just like they don't have that innate hatred of it in terms of the West where even our religion you know we have the mother Mary or you know saintly virgin and we have Jesus Christ you know man or you know Saint John or whatever so it's like we have these very big role models wherein if you ever read Eastern religion there's lots and lots of like figures in that that are both man and woman and so it's like a very like gender fluid kind of like i wouldn't say society but they have these role models which are gender fluid where with us it's like no it's actually like you know son of god blah 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 so i don't know yeah so i don't know if you feel like that factors in with people's i don't, I don't know what you, would you call it conservatism in the sense that they don't want to even speak about these things i guess i'm not sure if i if that's the right word but you know what i mean like they, they wouldn't say anything to you because they don't want to appear a certain way probably yeah definitely I, I think you summed it up really well in that it's it's kind of be seen not heard in a, in a in a terrible way and it's an entire subclass of of you know the population that are now speaking out and, and that i think really japan isn't quite at trans rights yet it's still dealing with gay rights and 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 that kind of element to it but because they're doing it on a modern platform everything is kind of being put together so in a, in a good sense you know it's like i feel like japan it will be behind the times for years and then it will catch up abruptly and, and loads of different things and it will kind of hurdle forward i can't speak for the japanese lgbt plus community but from who i know in my network and who what, what i've seen following it on the news it's it's the same thing as we were talking about like you said about the old age people that are left outside of the capitalist cycle it's like unless you can be a part of society and assimilate and not cause any problems you're going to be pushed to the sideline and I, and I think that what we would class as kind of like the um, Blair White kind of of the world of like I pass, I'm a trans woman but I'm fine I had money to change my appearance, I'm working, I'm happy, I'm fine I, I would say that that may be something that we would see or, or at least that's what's expected of people it's like do what you want, live your own life, not my child but just don't cause a fuss. And I think that's at a, at, that's like at the, at the general opinion. But then obviously at a policy level, that's it's not quite, like you say, being implemented by the government. And, and that makes that harder. So it's a bit of a juxtaposition there. Um, yeah. It's interesting to see, though, that there are conservative talking points that slip through. And in that recent kind of discussion of the LGBTQI understanding law, where they're kind of they worded it like, you know, let's try and make everyone happy. Let's try and have LGBT people live amongst everyone else. The Conservative Party and the uh, different parties had to kind of argue about what, how they would phrase the law and what would happen and what wouldn't happen. And while it was happening, you could see in, you know, what would be the parliament technically, the Conservatives getting upset at certain points and like storming out and tweeting things like oh well trans women could use a japanese hot spring now a woman's hot spring or public toilet and and so you see the the conservative talking points kind of slipping through the cracks which is interesting but it does it does kind of fall a little bit more on deaf ears than i would say it does in the uk and in the west because most people most average japanese people that i speak to specifically are like i couldn't care less in a good way like some of my closest japanese friends have, I've, I was a nanny to a Japanese family in the UK and I actually said to her kind of sheepishly like I am trans is that going to be okay like you know I know you've asked me to be your nanny but would that be okay with your kids 
because I'm so like used to these narratives. And she just laughed and was like, I'd love my kids to be put in front of an LGBT person. Like I'd love for them to learn about different things and, and grow up well. And I was like, oh wow, that's how, that's a really healthy way of looking at it, thank you. No, I, I find that all, all really interesting. And it's just like, um, not, not saying that trans people ever had it easy, but um, in the UK, I think the attitude of live and let live used to be more prevalent and i i don't know if you wasn't there there was a trans storyline on i don't it was one of the soaps and then i read a report of someone in the 50s who was a trans woman and it treated it always like that some sort of thing that was really interesting but then it wasn't tainted with loads of fear mongering about and now they're gonna come into the women's changing room and rape you and stuff and it feels like I, I, what I hate about living in England is how the US culture war always gets imported here. So w obviously we, we've had our own problems with homophobia, but it's like, well, they start doing it in America about gay people in bathrooms. Let's not forget everything about bathrooms is from the original uh, culture war against gay people. And then it gets brought into the UK where all gay people are, are pedophiles, basically. But now they're saying the exact same stuff about trans people. And that they started that in the US and then it all comes over here where Rishi Sunak is saying, and I know what a woman is, or something like that. And it's like, you, you, don't even, you don't even believe what you're saying. Like, I know you don't believe. I know you don't give a shit about transgender people. Like, it's not even about, like, trans rights. They don't care about transgender people because transgender people are, like, this minority that most people aren't going to really see in their own personal lives, maybe see it in the media a bit more. So, like, most people, like, I, I and I read a poll because we have this perception of, you know, England being Turf Island, and it was... At the very minimum of people being able to identify how they want, English people are overwhelmingly accepting of that. It's only when it gets to like the cultural issues of bathrooms where there's a bit more like people don't really know how to act, probably because they've been told that, you know, all transgender people are scary predators or whatever, like gay people were perceived to be in, in the 80s and 90s. But then it's like, I think there is, there was that element in England of this like live you know and i think english english culture is a bit similar where people don't want to make a scene and i think with ne with neoliberalism to an extent i think we've become more like americans where i think even my well i'm i'm technically on the border of gen z i think i'm millennial but i think there is an element now of people do want to draw attention to themselves but there is that very old-fashioned english thing of don't make a scene so the notion of going up to someone and being like harassing them for their identity i think in inherently is not an english cultural thing but it's been imported from america of like you must be some crusader against what you perceive to be as like threats to children they always hide behind and like, like with japanese i think they still have the element of well i might not actually like it but the thought of like running around and screaming it on the campaign trail for the tory party it, it you know I, I don't know if I'm being too kind to English people because I do have my issues with, <laughs> with English people, but I do I do honestly think as someone who grew up in a country where I never even thought about transgender people, like I literally, I don't even think I understood what transgender people, like what real like transgender person even was until I was like an older teenager because I never heard about it. So then I'm supposed to believe that now suddenly everyone just absolutely hates transgender people because we're told they're like, you know, a certain way like it is it, it does feel like it's a manufactured culture war to help win elections to be honest i knew i was female at like five years old i didn't know what a trans person yeah. was until like ugly <laughs> betty when the the sister came yeah. out and i was like wait that's an option <laughs> holy shit <laughs> sign me up like and, and so i completely agree i have seen that ha that process change of like what almost like where japan is now of like not my child, but I don't need to know about it. Good for you. I would never say anything in the street. And then that also kind of like that rare storyline you hear that's actually not that negative. And, and I think you're talking about the coronation storyline where you technically had a canon trans character for years in the story who had married a guy there and they were just this old couple that lived and they just lived happily ever after. But ironically now, if you had released that storyline, you would see more of, you know, manufactured hatred for literally no reason and and yeah and i would say that it's worrying to think that japan could be at the precipice of that but i also don't think that it has the same kind of um mass backing is a movement most people you do see like conservative 
media that, that, that kind of handle, I saw this advert that had a kind of masculine expressing person wearing female, um, like sports gear. And the, the Japanese narrator was like, is this a woman? Is this a man? apparently to Nike we can never know the difference and and it was like but it was Japanese like passive-aggressive transphobia and it just didn't work and and I saw this panel and they were like this is not gonna land in Japan like people don't give a shit and like so I'd like to think it's not gonna happen but again like you say it's it's kind of imported from the US which is sad to see because when you go to Asia like I was talking about Pakistan the whole of like East Asia South Asia Southeast Asia the view of, uh, which you answered for, for me in Japan, the view of gender is so different from the West, just in terms of either like androgynous people or trans people. Like, I, I guess that is like what my, my first exposure to trans people was, you know, the quote, lady boy in Thailand, which is just trans trans woman. But obviously it's seen as something like, like racialized, something like exotic and orientalist and stuff. But then, um, yeah, and it's literally just used as a prostitute or something like that. But um, but I found that interesting because reading about Pakistan's view and India's view of this third gender, which usually is what we would think of as a trans woman, um, even though they call it something different. And I was just thinking like, but we also talk about how Japan is this island nation where it doesn't necessarily have this connection where, you know, Thai, Cambodian and Indian history is very like, you know, and Chinese as well. Like It has this exchange all the time where I've read a lot about Japan's history in relation to these other countries, Japan literally just like goes off the map for like 500 years in like the, I think it's between like um, 100 AD and like 500 just goes away. And then one day shows up in Korea with like a bunch of mercenaries to fight like these Chinese back kingdom. It's, it's a very weird history where it keeps like going away and just like isolating itself from Korea and China, which I do believe the original Japanese people are actually from China and Korea going back like a very long time in history so I was thinking like it wouldn't be surprising with what you're saying that there is like this rigid gender binary in Japan of we'll just pick one where in somewhere like other countries it's like no there is there is this other gender you, you can be which isn't necessarily either um, and I, I, I find that very interesting just because I'm telling you like trying to tell my mom about the differences in gender and how your condition in the West to view gender in a very specific way, like hardline way, and then it obviously primes you very well for fascism as well, because fascism is ultra patriarchy. And when you live on the patriarchy, it's like gender norms, gender roles, you have to look a certain way and act a certain way. But um, yeah, a a a Asia is, is, you know, different parts of Asia are very different. But yeah, Japan, as as the Asian England, I wouldn't, <laughs> I'm not surprised in what you say. That, that is interesting. Let's just hope it doesn't follow us. And I'm hoping because Japan fundamentally is so different from the UK, it won't be as susceptible to parroting like American news narratives as we are. Even hearing you talk about the genders in other kind of Asian and countries, it makes me realize, of course, that, that that's not even an option. There's no non-binary gender. There's no like Mao or anything like that. But um, what was I gonna say? That, is linguistically a bit of a different sense of self in the use of like first person pronouns and how we have like I or me or mine. Um, Japanese quite famously has like very different spectrum of gendered pronouns. So like you can have Ore, which is very masculine or all the way down to like Atashi, which is very feminine. So there is that element to it. You get to kind of pick and, and, and make yourself a person, but Again, they're still within the framework of very much the binary gender of male or female. When I was in Asia, it was very easy to take myself out of caring as much as I do when I'm here. I don't know if you can relate to that at all because you've obviously been there for so long now, but like it kind of feels like it's not happening in reality because I, I live in a place that's so remote from everything that's happening. Yeah, absolutely. Specifically for me with the transgender stuff happening in the UK, and seeing people I'm kind of connected to go to protests and see the UK government do these terrible things. I am aware of it and I can talk about it and I can try and help and be an activist from overseas, but like I am distant enough from it that I can keep my mental health where it needs to be as well. So, so yeah, I can completely understand that. And I think that that is also important. I mean, I spoke about this with another creator, but like you have to keep your glass full 
before you can pour into someone else's. And I think that covering these really uh, absolutely atrocious topics constantly and being in the thick of it, and like you say, being banned, getting harassed, it can't be good long term, can it? So I I'm glad that you've at least got a way out. I haven't felt this terrible about politics since like Jeremy Corbyn lost the election in 2019, only because it was like this moment of like hopelessness of like, I can't believe, and also it's, it's linked to what we're talking about right now because he was destroyed being called an anti-Semite, weaponizing all this stuff against him. And now, and now like I was saying to my girlfriend just before we were on this call, they, they so cynically weaponized it against him. And now they weaponize it so hard. They're all sitting silent while this terrible thing happens because they're so scared of being called a racist. Like, and I'm saying it's bizarre that because they've done this stuff to destroy like a good and like, you know, a principled man like Jeremy Corbyn, now he's the one speaking out and they're all silent because it's like, oh my God, what we've, this climate we've created, we can't, you know, be seen as he's racist. So in my head, these are two events that like, I link them together, but it's very depressing covering this stuff because you just feel so like powerless and hopeless. And I guess that's what I kind of liked about living in Asia for a bit besides the fact that, you know, it's interesting living in different political systems like communist authoritarian monarchy like Thailand and like Cambodia, which is just like a mess, like military dictatorship. But it's just interesting li living in those societies and just thinking about like, I'm so far away from all these problems now. Um, and it, yeah, like um, that's why it's just so, like Japan was a very interesting country to me as well. Cause I don't know if you feel like this. I haven't been anywhere in my life that has felt more like England than Tokyo. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I can get into a whole bunch of these things. Yeah, definitely my friends at uni, we all, we call it, a lot of people say because it's an island nation as well. And that has affected people's opinions of uh, like xenophobia and stuff like that. And in the negative sense, but there's also some really lovely pa like parallels, but I completely agree. It's, it's like a weird home from home in, in some ways that, especially when I speak to American people out here, American expats and stuff, they don't have that same affinity. Like everyone is weirdly cold and everyone is weirdly busy. And I'm like, oh, that's London. Yeah, with Tokyo, it's like the tube, the way people dress for work. And then I was sitting in, I was sitting in a park with my girlfriend and obviously we live in Southeast Asia and some of it is just so polluted. Like even if you go outside to a park, it's just you know the air you're breathing is terrible. We we're sitting in this park and and people playing baseball and football, and it was like kind of cold, um, which we hadn't experienced since we left because we've been living in like very hot places. And I was like, this feels like I'm in a park in London in the autumn. It, it was April, but I'm like, this is such a weird feeling to be here and like feel like I am back home basically. Like I I, I think. If I said that to someone, I'd be like, okay, Japan's not worth visiting then because it's just like England. But I'm like, it reminds me of England, like very surface level analysis. It reminds me of England if everything on the surface was a lot nicer, like, you know, cleaner. Um, it feels a lot, it, you know, I mean, by every metric, it's a lot safer as well. Um, and it's just like, if it, it, yeah, it feels just like, a, and on the surface, it like, just is quite interesting and feels like for a tourist perspective it work it works well um you know i i like i like england on a very surface level a lot as well it's just the, the culture is really rotten here um but yeah japan japan is definitely like I, I, no wonder you, like you stay because i said to my girlfriend like, i could totally imagine living here like out of every place i've been like vietnam too chaotic too polluted thailand i liked a lot but in terms of the political system i'm not sure if i'd be that comfortable living there forever cambodia like is cool but like same kind of deal but japan was kind of like it feels very much like i've just gone to english like asia or something it's, it's a very weird experience <laughs> absolutely no i completely get it and i and you're not the only one and I, I, I definitely a few british people in in my uni kind of time had a similar thing and a lot of the people that have stayed in japan for several decades now and are still here are those kind of british um, you know, friends I had at uni. So you're definitely not the only one. I think yeah. seasonally for sure it has that. I mean, I mean, when we go to university, the first thing the teachers say is like, Japan is a mystical country with four seasons. And, and everyone from like most similar kind of weather systems are like, we've been known about them, like that's fine. But so you get that kind of, um, it's like that, but plus alpha. So like everything has seasonal stuff. So like, the you know special spring Kit Kats come out and in autumn everyone celebrates the the leaves turning brown and it's like it's like 
England on steroids a, a tiny bit in that sense, but in a lovely, safe and, and very, I don't know, pleasing way. So yeah. Yeah, Aesthet aesthetically, um, not in like an orientalist way, just in terms of just like, um, it just it just look it just looks very nice. Like I I'll never forget this memory because we got a flight from Hanoi to Tokyo, and um, I think we left 9 p.m. in Hanoi, Japan. I think is two hours ahead, and we we have got to our hotel at four the next day. So it was a horrible journey, um, but I remember walking out and obviously because in Tokyo you have to get the train everywhere. So lugging around my massive like traveling like camping bag on a train was not fun especially after like a massive flight. But then I remember walking out and it was by the Sky Tower is where a hotel was. And I remember walking out and it was like cold, sunny and the air was so clean. I was like, oh my God, like it's the best place ever. Like straight like straight away. It was such a relief to, to go here. And like, yeah, it, it literally, and I was amazed. I was like, I'm in the city and this air feels so clean. And I went to um, Seoul later and I kind of wish I went to Seoul first because it was actually quite disappointing in comparison to Japan. Because it felt like I was going more like it felt actually weirdly a lot more like Southeast Asia than Japan. Like it felt in my mind, it reminded me a lot more of Bangkok than Tokyo, which I always thought like oh Seoul and Tokyo they'll feel similar. But then it, when I actually went there, I was like no Bangkok reminds me of Seoul a lot more. But then yeah, like I I, I just really liked it and I, I'd love to explore it a bit more because we only did Tokyo four or five days, Kyoto four or five days, and we went to Osaka in one of those days. So not not too long. Um, but yeah, Tokyo especially, like, yeah, I thought it was so cool. Like, I just really want to go back. It is good. And you went to a good place. And my mum re recently came to visit and, and she took like two weeks off. And we and, and I kind of set up a tour that was kind of bespoke to her. So lots of rest days, lots of shopping days. But we, we did, we hit Tokyo for the first half and then came down to where we're living in Osaka. And then surrounding Osaka, obviously, you've got Kobe, Kyoto and Nala. Um, and so we managed to like do like a night in each different area to give her a kind of flavor of the different types of places as well because obviously like you, you would have seen Tokyo is very built up it's the most built up you can get but then Nala is like Nala and Kyoto are very traditional there's loads of temples and it's a complete juxtaposition and stuff so but yeah if you, if you ever are back I would love to take you some places around as well because it is it's a very different thing to tour when you have someone speaking the language but also just that it basically if you can get the confidence to go down you know the secret alleyways and find a small ramen shop that's been there for 50 years that is run by an old Japanese family you're gonna have such a different experience to the chain store that's just everywhere you know that that and and I think that I'm you know I always I'm an advocate for trying that if you can obviously it's easier said than done well, some of them say no, no, for, no foreigners. Some do, and I have had that. Don't get me wrong. I remember. Oh, uh, I, I, yeah. I need to find where it is in Tokyo. It's, it's like the the seedy area that inspired Blade Runner. I don't remember what it's called. It's not Harajuku, and we're walking around. It was really cool, but it, yeah, it was like no foreigners or tourists, and I was like, okay. Yeah, I've had I've had the worst experience I had was we were in a kind of pub club area. And it said it said Japanese speakers only, and I was with my Japanese native friends, and they were like, "She's cool. She speaks she speaks better Japanese than we do. Don't worry, she's fine." And then the, the actual owner had to come out and be like, "We say Japanese speaking only because we just don't want we we don't speak English." And it was like, "Oh, she doesn't need to speak English. She can order, and she's fine. She's a good person, so she's fine." And they were like, "No, no, no, no. Only Japanese speakers native." And I, and I, and they were like, the Japanese friends were shocked. They were like. I mean, that's just outright racist and 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 they were like we oh, know sorry you can't come in and so it it does happen and i and i think that that's and that's definitely something we can talk about the kind of the tourist elements and the glorification of japan are there for a reason it's a great place and obviously we're happy to live here and i have so much good to say about it but there is this kind of sinister undertone of xenophobia and um yeah it's it's very safe. It's very, it's very pleasing. But there's a there's a large change coming, I think, to the country. And so I experienced Japan like ten years ago, and coming back here, um, dabbling in working out here as well, and seeing my husband work and, and properly, you know, get a job and career here, I can kind of make that kind of comparison of ten years, which is 
I would say even different to someone that's lived here for the full 10 years, because sometimes when you when you stay somewhere, you're not aware of the changes to, to that extent. But um, it definitely feels now that Japan knows it has to rely on foreign labor much more than it did want to admit 10 years ago. And so we've, we've, we've heard about the shrinking population of Japan for so long, but now we're actually seeing it. And we're seeing a, a kind of complete lack of trust in the pension system in the future. We have a, the kind of Japanese version of Gen Z is, is an entire generation that want to be YouTubers and they don't want to get a job like their parents did and work silly hours and never see their kids, you know, and <clears throat> true to an extent in many countries, but Japan is finally now seeing the effects of this. So it's quite interesting to see the juxtaposition of, and there's a lot of talk of um, kind of business consultation companies are really, you see them a lot more now that are trying to help companies hire foreign labor um, implement diversity in companies and stuff like that which is a really interesting shift and and I think that the thing I take from it mostly is that Japan just is kind of doesn't want to admit that it's going to need to rely on a lot of, of foreigners as they would call them but it kind of also knows it has to so it's in that kind of kind of denial phase right now if that makes sense yeah no um and didn't they recently reject something in parliament about making it easier for foreign laborers to come over as well yes yeah exactly so um which again you can see the the kind of two sides of the coin there's obviously a very conservative roots in parliament the liberal democrat party which are a very conservative party have been in power the majority for decades but then there is just this push of like it has to happen eventually and and that's going to be the opinion of many people in the future, I imagine. Yeah, the the thing is, what's interesting sometimes with these like debates is, you they they can't have their cake and eat it too. Like, if you want to maintain Japan's place as this like leading economy, you can't just not allow migrant labour in, because otherwise you've got to admit that there's going to be less people being able to work. So you have to scale back loads of stuff. But then, um, like you were saying, like you know. I think what's not talked about in Japan with the racism is even though like you've experienced like, kind of like this like anti non japanese let's call it like non-Japanese xenophobia rather than maybe like anti-white because I don't think they really cared about you were white. It was more like you weren't Japanese. <laughs> but um, they, they also feel that way about like Korean laborers, Chinese laborers, Indian laborers. Um, and it's pretty amazing. Like, we went to an Indian restaurant and seeing like a, an Indian migrant speak like Indian to one family or like one of the Indian languages, not sure which one it was. English to us and then Japanese to someone else. So this is obviously everyone knows if people from migrant backgrounds that don't speak English often are great with languages, like not not you know just English. But that was that was an interesting thing to see. But um, I, I you know most people love like studio like Ghibli films and stuff. And I made a video about this a while ago. It's like the difference between Miyazaki and Hideo Kojima who made the Metal Gear games because they're two different. One guy is in his late 50s one guy's in his mid 80s and it's kind of interesting to see that japanese mentality because miyazaki super hates western stuff um and like because he because he grew up during the war and afterwards so he saw his country literally go from like japanese to occupied by a foreign country have their whole political system designed by a foreign country and then have the foreign culture really influence it but then someone like kojima he loves the foreign, he loves American stuff because he grew up, he grew up in a country where everyone loved American stuff. And it's really interesting because you have like two people who are like, you know, proud to be Japanese, but like one's way more open about like, oh, I love everything, like all this different culture. One's like, no, Japanese, like traditionalist. Um, it reminds me of uh, Tolkien and Lord of the Rings a bit, actually, like how he saw the Norman conquest as like one of the most tragic things that ever happened to England and stuff because he loved Anglo-Saxon history. That's what Miyazaki reminds me of. And it's interesting today because in Japan, like you were saying, like you have these Gen Z people who in theory you think would be more open. I'm not sure what the reality is. And it, it's probably like the contrast is there with you have like the 50 year old politicians who are like, oh, like we must preserve like Japanese culture, whatever that it means to them. But then you might have younger people who grow up with like, uh, so not even just love loving Western stuff, but loving, you know, um, Korean stuff as well. Like what, what was interesting when I got the flight uh, to Korea was people from Korea who were just bringing back shopping from Japan. Like they literally had no bags apart from shopping bags. So that it's clear they just went to Japan for a weekend, bought shopping and they're coming back. So then you have like 
I guess the younger people would be more open to like this cultural crossover. So it's, it's an interesting place it finds itself in, but then it's completely dominated by one party. Like you're saying, it's 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 conservative, but not in the traditional sense of. I don't think it really fits in the mold of maybe like a Western conservative party, but like you're saying, culturally, it's very like xenophobic conservative, um, and it's just I, I guess it's depressing for Japanese people because like there's no real alternative and japanese communism is is strong enough in terms of electorally it does better than most communist parties but then a lot of people like to remind me that the japanese communist party they're not as communist as other parties or whatever but then i think it's cool they have that element but then it's still like they're super minor parties still and it's like for japanese yeah it's like what well, what is really the option it's even worse in the uk like what what do you even choose apart from you know the liberals and stuff absolutely i think that especially in the UK and the US, there's this tennis match. And, and even if it's a show and even if it's a facade, there's this tennis match between like conservative and Tory, Republican and Democratic. But Japan is, the LD, LDP, the Liberal Democrats are always gonna have, if not, they're just gonna form a coalition like they have done with Komeito, the um, kind of a bit more center-right party with religious roots. They're just gonna form a coalition with who they need to to, to maintain that majority. But that's always left like a, a sense that there's no point really getting into politics and I think that I, I'm, I would imagine that's mirrored down into Gen Z but my millennial generation that I'm more, I know about more is, is that like politics is nowhere near as popular to just even talk about in Japan because what's the point it's not like there like you say there's no variation and but the one thing I would say the co communist parties and there are a few communist parties now like all quite weak in power but you have Kyosan, um a kind of like the main one the jcp i think they're called and they have like historical roots and they have this history which i think is also kind of rare to see because any history in the west of, of communism is obviously like like kind of red scare like stamped out vibe well I, th I think they have a bit of legitimacy for being the only japanese people to resist the fascist government oh yeah violently um, violently uh, as well yeah and then, um, but also, sadly, that the CIA literally created the Liberal Party to crush communism in Japan. So, but but they, like you're saying, there is that tradition where in the UK, the La the Labour Party pretty much undermined any like Marxism because it's like we are socialism, so you don't need Marxism. But then various Labour governments, you know, 30s, 60s, 90s, didn't did some good things. Let's you know, in the 40s maybe, but like you know, very much not enough i'd say but yeah like no it definitely is interesting japan has that history despite having like very xenophobic or culturally conservative elements and stuff kind of even above politics is that it is a really good country for taking care of its, its own people and you can take that in in such a good and bad way but at the end of the day like this the the communist party is also in charge of a lot of social welfare and 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 like the teachers unions and stuff it kind of controls them and that's in, in a good sense yeah. from our opinion if that makes sense so yeah. in a sense that like i find japan in general for me comes across very neoliberal it's very much like if you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps and to some extent add to society then you will just coast through and try not to want too much try not to do too little and you'll be fine like that's unfortunately it's that very kind of neoliberal version of, of what we would compare in the west and yeah then people that are untouchable at the top are just untouchable. You'll never get there. Don't try to be. Um, but equally, you know, there'll be more support for people less fortunate and, and etc. So in that sense, yeah, it's, it's like, like a very classist fair kind of in a different way. In a different maybe. way. Yes. In a different way. It's yeah. it, in compared to the classism in the UK where it's very clear cut. I mean, I actually get Japanese people ask me like, What's it like to have an upper class? What's it like to be working class? And it feels like, it, I know this is weird to say, it feels like Japanese people are every class and they want to be every class, if that makes sense. Like there's there's a pride in being the working class that we wouldn't see in the West, absolute pride in it. And like, but then equally everyone wants to be rich enough to afford nice watches and Chanel things and go shopping yeah. in Shinjuku, you know? Yeah, I have a question about that because a lot of people talk about Japan being collectivist and like even kind of what you've just been saying in terms of they'll look after themselves or like the society if it's perceived as Japanese and stuff. But then you talk about like the neoliberalism. 
So it, it, in my head, it kind of sounds like like the theoretical thing of what capitalism is supposed to be in terms of um, you have to serve a greater purpose, like no laziness or welfare queens in this country. But if you perform your role in capitalism, then in theory, you should be good. It's kind of like, it, it sounds like in theory what you're sold with capitalism. Not um, Obviously, Japan you know, has homeless problems, has loads of issues as well. But I'm saying like, because of like the collectivism, you're like, you're kind of, it's kind of like if you pull your weight in society, then society will value you. Where in the UK, it's kind of like, pull your weight or fuck you, basically. Like, it's like, make money or go fuck yourself. Yeah, well, and also in the UK, it feels like there's this kind of falsified narrative of like, if someone's on benefits, they're sponging off society. Whereas I think with, with Japan after the bubble, like burst, there was a kind of, there's so many people affected that it kind of as a nation had to understand, like, okay, this was really serious. We have businessmen with, you know, in living in rows under bridges, homeless, and they leave their shoes outside the the, the box in their little like front door game can area. Like it was a, a huge situation. So it had to be, kind of be faced. And, and like I say, Japan is better at caring for its, its own, but you're right in that, the other side of that is also very much still the same. Like if you if you can work, you must work, and if you can't work, yeah. you are you have to justify being lesser, and and you are just kind of kicked to the curb. And I, I would imagine it's it's probably just better at hiding it than than solving the problem. I came here ten years ago, and I worked as a translator in a company, and that was like an entry level job. My husband now, having a career as an English teacher, is on the same salary. A decade later and rent is obviously not the same inflation is starting to creep up after decades of it not moving i think like it feels like capitalism has finally caught up with japan and it's yeah. it's going to have coasted through for a long time and then suddenly people are going to really start to see the effects and didn't like a like a 30 year old i think it's a politician he said i because there was a film coming out called something 75 about euthanizing old people in japan and I think a politician had recently said that they should euthanize people over 80 or something to save the economy money. I think it was a politician or someone famous in Japan had said this. And it's just like what you were kind of saying, like your worth to society, even though there's this collectivist element about caring for each other, maybe when you're in work, it's still seen, well, if you're old, your use is, your value is over. Like you cannot contribute to society anymore, which is kind of like neoliberalism anyway. Like, your worth is tied to how hard you work. But I guess in the West, you're sold this dream of work hard for 50 years, get a nice pension from the government and get your reward or whatever, so, some shit like that. But like, it feels like with, you know, maybe attitudes in Japan, not that I know for sure, but in terms of, you know, because of this collectivism, it's like, you, you got to pull your way. And I think I was reading a lot and you'll probably know about this, uh, like even Shinzo Abe's government trying to bring in people or like policies to make people take their holidays at work because holidays in Japan are relatively good, but no one takes them because of the pressure of, well, if you take a holiday, you're lazy and you're letting everyone else down. And like, I found that interesting as well, because it's like, why, why like this country, you know, has better workers' rights than other countries, but it's like people don't take advantage of it because of the pressure of, no, your whole worth is how hard you work, even though you don't have to legally, basically. Oh, I mean, it is. And, and fundamentally, yes, that's something that is, it's almost so prominent that I kind of forget to bring it up, if that makes sense. And I think that a, a whole part of my kind of journey from that kind of neoliberal girl boss that I was kind of brought up to be to finding socialism was starting my career technically in Japan really affected my opinion of work ethic and my productivity. And I, I mean, I have some horror stories of the first few companies I worked at. I actually asked to take a day off to fly home to the UK for Christmas. And I had to like walk up, it was like a massive open plan office. And I walked up to the woman from HR who was kind of like this, the boss's wife. And I, and I like kneeled down behind her and I was like, excuse me, please may I take one day holiday of my two weeks I'm allowed for the year so I can get a cheaper flight home. And she didn't even turn to me. She turned to the entire office and in this bellowing yet feminine voice just said, how long have you been in this company? Under a year. 
and you have the audacity to ask for a single day off. Oh, no. And then she like pointed to the like the head of finance and was like, head of finance, have you ever taken a day off? No. Head of sales, when was the last time you took a day off? Six years ago. And you think you should have a day off. Please tell me again why. And like this like 20 year old nothing of a person, the wisp of a, of a, of a human just cry, like just cried, ran to the toilets and my, my colleagues came up. I had been in the company for like three months. And so that obviously set me up to this like this understanding of like my worth is in my productivity and so you're completely right i mean it, it can it can look after its own it can have a, a good social welfare system but at the end of the day it's it's a it's, a, it's an extremely high octane capitalist machine and yes there are successes but it, it is also how i would have an opinion of it as a as, as a socialist as a communist is that it's gonna either need fuel to the fire or it's gonna burn out. Um, I, I have a few now connections in the YouTube kind of scene and I was speaking to a Japanese guy who has a very successful channel. He said, this entire generation wanna be YouTubers and streamers and VTubers because they don't wanna buy into the, the work system. They know there's not gonna be a pension system for them when they retire. So they are kind of grasping at some form of security um, but obviously not everyone can be a, a YouTuber. That's, that's not going to be sustainable. But, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know enough to, to like forecast, but I can kind of tell what's happening on the ground, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and it's just interesting, like everything you're saying, it's like you say it to someone and they're like, oh, that's good. But then like, so we're talking about that Hassan video and I responded to it. And he was saying that like, oh, in Japan, it's really hard to get fired. In Japan, you can have a job for life. And then you see in like Nintendo, the person who made Zelda and Mario in 1982, he still works there and he makes Mario today. And it's like, yeah, that is good. In like theory, it's a good thing to be like, oh, you have the job security. But then it's like, there's also the expectation you're meant to be loyal to this company as well. So it's like, that's not a good thing because you don't shop around for the best job to like that pays you, which capitalists would say you should do. It's like, no, I will be loyal to this company for 40 years just because i'm expected to like it, i don't think that personally sounds any better than like companies treating you bad to be honest what's actually happening in reality compared to the 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 best cases that are put forward i mean looking at those examples the creator of nintendo games is obviously going to be you know coveted position and good at their job and, and etc but i had three jobs in japan in the first year i worked there and I was fired in the second one for something completely outside of my control. But my boss of the branch was fired and we all had to lose our jobs. So the, the myth that you have a job for life is a very old fashioned, I think like 20, 30 years ago, maybe. But you also didn't have unions. That wasn't, that's not a thing. No one, like you say, took holiday. So you were, your second family was the office. You, you leave your actual wife and kids and you go to your family. Um, but these days, again, none of that, it's the same thing that we're seeing in the UK. All of the kind of benefits of capitalism for the, the labour workforce have been eaten away. Salaries haven't increased in decades. Inflation is slowly creeping up. No one, you know, everyone's overworked. Everyone's working weekends. Covid hit and everything in the same way. And so I wouldn't say you have the same job security. I would say, I'd say the opposite. I'd say it's it's turning to the gig economy again you know that we're seeing in the west well also like you were saying about the the hustle culture youtubers like if there's no promise of security and also I, I was reading about unions in japan and it's kind of followed the trend of america where it went from like crazy strong unions maybe like 50 years ago like maybe 70 percent of the workforce and now i think in japan and america it's it's like i think america's like 11 percent, and japan's like 15 percent. like it like even the uk's followed the same trend where it went from 80 to like 20 because obviously, thank you, neoliberalism, Margaret Thatcher, and just destroying the welfare state that, you know, and shipping out all the jobs to foreign countries that, like, we don't have that, you know, capability or workforce anymore. And it feels like, yeah, like, Japan... I made a couple of videos because a lot of the cyberpunk genre is, is, uh, was created in the, the kind of wake of the Japanese economic boom in the 80s. So it's kind of like that xenophobia baked in of, oh, Japan is taking over the world. And... Why did why did Japan Japan did there was this propaganda post I put in my video sometimes it's a uh, it's Pearl Harbor one cartoon it's like 1941 Pearl Harbor and it's like 1981 it's like 
um, economic Pearl Harbor by Japan, flooding the, the US economy with all, uh, all these great consumer goods. But then it just feels like Japan, with, with the 80s, it's like it didn't, it didn't really escape neoliberalism, but it just has its own like, twist on it, I guess, because I, I, find, I find different Asian systems like uh, of government very interesting because of, I guess it's religion, in some ways, although Japan's interesting because you have Shintoism, Buddhism, but then a lot, I read a lot of people are both as well because it's not incompatible. So, it's, yeah, and then um, Thailand is like 99% Buddhist, but then Vietnam is like a hit or miss really because of the communist system. But it's just interesting how they all have a different kind of approaches to capitalism. Um, but yeah, but I, and that's something I thought about when I was I was there because like Japan on the surface works like better, but then like we were saying it reflects england a lot so i recognize these japanese like 50 year old men on the train because that's my dad do you know what i mean like it, i i see the, the office workers like that's my dad that's my my dad in in japan like i look at these people and like you remind me of english people so much like i guess it's tokyo and tokyo and london as these economic centers and stuff it's all very very similar but then like you were saying there's there's good size and bad size to the japanese version of capitalism but then it is kind of it's brutal in a way that you can't get away with i guess in other country i unless okay let's say england versus japan because i've heard horror stories about america as well because there's like no protections in a lot of states but um yeah no it is, it is an interesting thing to talk about because like like just to end on this like little section like we have such this and I, you know it's very easy to get seduced by japan when you go over as a tourist and i think even more so for americans because america just does not have a society that functions it's literally a society that's designed for capitalism like even people being amazed by the public transport like Jap japanese public transport is good but if you've grown up in like a modern european city it's quite similar it's just it's just nicer yeah but then i guess if you come from la where it's five lanes like motorways everywhere you probably think it's the best thing you've ever seen in your life like oh my god I, like like hassan said our capitalism is finally working because the train the trains work and everything you know that old fascist saying you know trains run on time but um yeah like it, it, it's just it, it's just inter interesting because i feel like if you go in to japan with a bit more of an understanding of this is great for tourism it like everything that people like serve society like is amazing for tourism but then if you lived if you lived in a country where you couldn't easily as as easy go to an actual supermarket because everywhere's a family mart or or like a 7-Eleven and you got to eat that food or like you have no time to cook or you live in an apartment that's so small you literally just have a rice cooker then you might start thinking oh my god like maybe this isn't the perfect society even though if, when I'm running around Tokyo for two weeks with no time to sit down it's great but if I'm sitting in a apart tiny apartment um, all day it's probably not the best thing ever. Absolutely I think it's definitely it's very um hyper consumptionist is that a word um yeah. hyper consumerist but like it's like you say it's 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 designed to have you be able to buy what you want when you want and then life becomes about that everyone is very si si like singular on their own eating on their own you know that's become a whole genre of youtube video now like and like you say the there's a company there's a convenience store on every every road and that with no hyperbole even it's we like, live in it's like two, two, two. I mean, there's Seven Eleven is our combini of choice because we have one. How sad is that? And there are three within a five minute walk. Three of the same shop. It's insane. And yeah. and the food, the food is good, good enough quality compared to other places. But well, so there's. It's, 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 fast food. it's really interesting. It's, it's fast food. It's highly processed. It's not great for you. But also, because there's actually a food shortage happening. So all of those really nicely stocked shelves that I'm sure Hassan saw, you now see like a single onigiri on like a shelf because they're running out of food. And so, yeah, the cracks are kind of starting to show. Well, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you so much for taking the time. Your channel I've been watching for so long and it's so similar to where I want my very small channel to be. So it's an absolute honor to take the time to sit and talk to you today. Hi. How are you? Are you enjoying Matriarchetype? Thank you. I'm so glad you found me. 
Well, anyway, if you want to get more involved, we do have a Discord server. You can chat to the community. I'll be in there sometimes just chilling out. You get to like have a one-on-one -on -one with me if you so desire. Or you can, of course, become a YouTube member or a patron. And yes, this was secretly a patron plug from the beginning. <laughs> I got you. But seriously, I am trying to uh, get a few more of the like the smallest paying patrons, like two pound a month. Um, it just helps me expand the channel. If you can, please do support in any way you feel comfortable. But otherwise, check out some of my other videos, watch them to the end, and you'll be doing your bit to help grow Matriarchetype and increase the positivity for the LGBTQIA plus and ally community. So anyway, have a good day, have a look around, and let me know if you need any help.